Welcome to Buy the Bywater, a podcast on the Megaphonic Network. I'm Ned Raggett. I'm Oriana Schwint. I'm Jared Pekachak. And we're here to talk about all things J.R.R. Tolkien. His work, his inspirations and impact, creative interpretations in other media, languages, lore, ripoffs, parodies, anything we think is interesting. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to the 21st episode of By the Bywater. Great to have you with us, and all three of us are fully agreed that as compared to when we recorded the last episode, things feel a little more relaxed now. Thank mm. God. <laughs> so, not perfect, of course. <laughs> we will never yeah, claim that. <laughs> there's still, uh, you know, some problems <laughs> happening in, in our little corner of the world. In the corner of the universe and things like that. We will not... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Look around you. Uh, the, it's been it's been a cavalcade of idiotic headlines and other things. But uh, anyway, moving on. So uh, we uh, we look forward to giving you this uh, last episode for the year, and then we can send this year behind us and never speak of it again. So, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we'll take that. In the meantime, we also want to say that Oriana has now fully moved into her new spot. And again, you can't see it, but uh, we've been appreciating her uh, setup uh, in uh, the room there, and uh, it's uh, it it looks nice. We were like, oh, we'll we'll try and create craft and aesthetic and then um we got you know wonderful presents from people that we're friends with including a venom head door knocker <laughs> yeah. uh so it's it's better to be it's better to have friends than an aesthetic is is i guess <laughs> my philosophy Speak for yourself <laughs> wow you know, okay <laughs> we've also we've also got a gritty like a stuffed gritty we've got a this is fine dog we've got it's it's pretty pretty eclectic yeah if we if we put this up as a video feed i'm the only one who actually has a tolkien thing on the wall behind me and that's the uh, that's the thing that was done uh, way back in the 80s uh, for a project I was involved in, and that placement was almost by chance. But in any event, you can't see it. There you go. We'll leave it at that. Um, but uh, we are otherwise all good to go here. So we hope you're all doing well uh, as we move into the end of the month here. We're recording this in uh, before uh, American Thanksgiving. Uh, this will be out, however, sometime in December. Uh, we hope you're all having a very safe holiday. Please keep in mind that though there is promising scientific news, it's still far from out of the woods yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so so uh, we, we send you our best over here on the West Coast to everyone else, and we hope you're staying well. That all said, there's stuff to talk about, stuff to do, uh, even though a lot of it is kind of retrospective, as you're about to find out. Because uh, we have a, we, well, you do have a main topic to get to, but first we have some news, sort of. Ish. So, <laughs> kind of. So, More Jared, please, <laughs> do take it away. Yeah, we'd love to tell you about news from the Amazon production, but there is nothing to report, period. They're just filming away or editing or God knows whatever they're doing down there, and there's no new news. We will say that this past January was when they broke the news of who was actually in the cast, so maybe we'll get something here in a couple of months, but who knows. So the only news to share is more details about stuff we're familiar with. First, there's a new illustrated version of The Silmarillion coming out with more work featured from Ted Naismith, who did an earlier version. Um, I've got it. It's gorgeous. I'm looking forward to this one. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Meantime, there is a full 4K remastered release of Peter Jackson's six films due in a few weeks for the holidays, along with the collector's edition version due next summer, which has, quote, new bonus content, unquote, whatever that means. <laughs> um, and finally, there's been further full confirmation on the release of the final collection of unpublished work by Tolkien, The Nature of Middle Earth. It'll be out in June, as previously indicated, and per the press release, its contents reach from sweeping themes as profound as elvish immortality and reincarnation and the powers of the Valar, to the more earthbound subjects of the lands and beasts of Numenor, the geography of the rivers and beacon hills of Gondor, and even who had beards. Who had beards? Are we getting confirmation of dwarf huh. women having beards? Is that what this yes. is? Yes. <laughs> Could it mean something else? Who knows? <laughs> so, beards in more than one sense. Who can say? Mm. So, but uh, yeah, a slum But yeah, the Ted Naismith uh, new uh, new Silmarillion. Uh, I, I have very much enjoyed Naismith's art. Uh, I, he, for me, along with uh, Lee and Howe, were kind of like the late twentieth century illustrators or Tolkien for me. I remember when I first saw Naismith stuff, I was very impressed. And yeah, his Silmarillion work that he did was really good. And, uh, this new edition looks very sharp. I mean, 
I almost, if I remember right, I think there's at least a couple of shots in Jackson's adaptations that are essentially nods to Naismith, even though, of course, he was not a featured artist on uh, Mm -hmm. that production. Uh, Although I gather he was approached, but that isn't something I think has been talked about much. I don't know, at least not formally. Who knows? And then, yes, the 4K remastered, uh, well, not The Hobbit. Like, we don't need to talk about that. I was going to say, <laughs> oh, all six films. Hmm, I only, rec- I only remember three. Hey, there's a collector's edition. There's only half of it here. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> uh, no. Well, we ultimately talk about The Hobbit, wh- the movies anyway, th- which is going to have to happen at some point. Um, it's just going to be a full hour of incoherent rage screaming. <laughs> 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 From me, pre- anyway. I don't want to speak for either of you. No. Nope. It'll, it'll be close. It will be, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> approaching that. I mean, I am interested to figure out, I mean, it, it's such a, it's not weasel words necessarily, but it's kind of like, you know, additional bonus content. What does that even mean? It could mean new interviews or other stuff done on the rest of it. I'm kind of hoping they dig into some of even the other stuff that still hasn't surfaced yet. They're like, you know, there's like, I remember on one of the commentary tracks, the one for Return of the King that Jackson and Fran Walsh and uh, Philip Boynes did, they were talking about the library scene, which apparently is some sort of confrontation between uh, 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 Elrond and Arwen or something like that. So, and they were like, oh, don't talk about the library scene. It's like, are we finally getting the library scene? Is that what's going on? So, um, you know, it'll it'll be interested to see what happens there. But, It'd be great uh, if it was like deleted scenes that didn't even get into the extended edition, because there's still stuff that i remember going back to that teaser thing that was released in like 2000 for the fellowship of the ring that had like unfinished vfx and stuff like that there was one shot of people running through trees that was clearly like the or rivendell or something and when i was little for some reason i was like oh, want to, oh my god that's what makes me want to see it then it wasn't in the movie then it wasn't in the extended edition and then it wasn't in any deleted it's somewhere out there and i want to see it i don't even care if it's just <laughs> two people running i want to see that one yeah, shot yeah. I know what you're talking about. I think that was supposed to be a shot of young Aragorn and young Arwen going tra-la-la through the trees. I could be wrong. There is definitely Which sounds a... tacky as heck, but I still want to see it. 2020, we all just want to see people frolicking through the woods. Frolicking, maskless, and not even having to worry about it. Yep. And there's definitely a scene, another scene I just remember that was sort of hinted at in the trailers. In the in the trailers that followed for Fellowship is a part, there's a part where, again, there's now, it's the Fellowship running through the trees of presumably Lorien. And, uh, and Legolas turns around and just, you know, draws the bow. And he's basically aiming towards the camera. And then a shot, which I guess was the following shot, is that it's basically arrows sort of flying over, I think, Mary's head. And looking back and hitting back pursuing orcs or something like that. So, again, not something that's ever ended up in any of the cuts. Um, I think it was an alternate read on... On what it might have been pursued in DeLorean, I don't know. Uh, we'll find out. If maybe, maybe this maybe, will surface. Yeah. Maybe it won't. Maybe we'll get something else entirely. So, uh, but there's definitely a lot of stuff there. I and you know, again, who knows how much content? Who knows what's going to put on here? I wouldn't mind the full cut of for the three original the the, the Lord of the Rings films, uh, which I believe they did for all three films. The full cut, not of the rough cuts that they were you know putting together effects are in, but the storyboards. Remember how in the making of oh. documentaries they had these storyboards and yeah. they had people acting out local actors and they basically did a version of it just through storyboards with basic you know uh, you know again dialogue and things like this. I wouldn't mind that at all. I mean, I'll give you an equivalent example. Uh, this is something that the re-releases of uh, Miyazaki's Studio Ghibli work has been good at, where they have things where, the, alongside the film, they can run things where it shows you the original sketch sort of storyboard as Miyazaki or the artists are sort of figuring out how the film is going to go. So you see the original sketches. This is kind of an equivalent of that, only it's more elaborate precisely because they yeah. had done a full production of it. Now, if wishes were horses, we'll see what this all is. If this is just sort of like newly filmed introductions, they'll be like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I right. don't care about that. Yeah. And then, yeah, we have the new Tolkien book. And, yeah, a little more detail. Lands and Beasts of Numenor. Hmm. Oh, I so, see, excited. You know, I, so excited. Yes. What could it mean? <laughs> and more, more, more geography on Gondor. I can tell you that. Beards, indeed. So, yeah, it'll, it's whatever, whatever shows up, it'll be nice to just have that much little more. And that, that it clearly clears the deck. I mean, I can't imagine, I mean, anything left unless there's some lost manuscript which turns right? up, which would be perfect, which would be ultimate. <laughs> you know, wouldn't that be the way? So we will see. Okay. So there's, there's what news we have, so we might as well just move on into the main topic and turn it back to Jared. It is his choice this time for the episode. Jared, once again, the floor is yours. So we're talking about the Father Christmas letters. Because mm. um, it's the holidays. These are a, if you have never heard of them, 
um, and it, I hadn't for a really long time, actually. Um, these are a series of letters that Tolkien wrote to his children in like the, the guise of Father Christmas. He first sent them in, starting in 1920, um, almost exactly a year ago this month. We're recording in November. Um, he sent it was December 22nd, 1920 was the first letter to his oldest son, John, who was three at the time. And it's, it did this big, easy to read. Well, maybe not that, maybe not for people nowadays, but at the time, I'm sure it was easy to read <laughs> um, this big loopy cursive that like a three-year-old could maybe puzzle over. And he sent them nearly every Christmas afterward to all the children, sometimes individually, sometimes collectively, and usually illustrated them. And they came in envelopes with these little hand-drawn stamps. Um, he even got the mail carrier to deliver them for added realism. The The children would write, would write letters to, fathers, to Father Christmas and he and put them in the fireplace and Tolkien would like secretly take them out of the fireplace and read them and then be able to answer them as Father the Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, and then this went on for like 20 years. He ended them in 1943 when his daughter Priscilla was 14. So he spent a ton of his life. <laughs> I mean, maybe not percentage wise, but like this is a long span of time that he was doing this. And so they're, they, they're, like, they're from Father Christmas, but Father Christmas starts talking almost immediately about his friend, the North Polar Bear, who eventually gets the name Karhu, which is Finnish for bear. Then the bear brings in all these other characters, like his cousin, the Great Bear, um, his nephews, Paksu and Velkotuka, which are fat and white hair in Finnish. Um, and then this elf secretary, Ilbreth, shows up after a while, and then Santa fights wars against the goblins with the assistance of the red gnomes and everything. So they, as you can probably tell, they start out really really basic as as you know befits a letter written to a toddler and then they get more and more complicated until there's an actual plot line uh mm -hmm. even if, like just albeit a slight one but it's still there like the first few letters are about the north polar bear often abbreviated to npb or just like cargo or whatever mm -hmm. um doing like they're about him doing wacky things like breaking the literal north pole which uh, falls onto Father Christmas's house and forces him to move to a new one where it's not in danger of the pole falling on it. These incidents keep happening, usually caused by the polar bear, where papers or gifts get ruined. Like uh, something floods, I think it's a bathtub, mm -hmm. overflows, mm -hmm. or yeah. like the bear leaves a window open and wind dis 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 disorganizes everything. So papers and gifts get ruined, explaining why the Tolkien children aren't going to get exactly what they wanted that year, uh, and so on. It's so cute. And then in later letters, Father Christmas runs into troubles with the goblins of the North, and has an entire miniature war with them where he's allied with the Red Gnomes. And probably not coincidentally, this is at the same time as the outbreak of World War II. Uh, characters, like I said, the characters keep getting added who then become narrators of letters mm -hmm. in their own right. Mm -hmm. um, there's all these like hints at ancient history and untold stories. Father Christmas refers to his, quote, green brother and talks about these long-running conflicts with the goblins. He talks about like, oh, I thought it, we defeated them in, I think it's 1453 or something. And and he even reproduces some of the goblins' cave paintings. There's this one letter where the polar bear gets gets lost, and Father Christmas is super worried about him, goes looking for him, and finds him in the goblin caves, which have these... You can, uh, I really encourage everybody to at least borrow this from the library and look at these, because a lot of these are really beautifully illustrated, and this one letter has a picture of the goblin caves, with have, which have these really cool, elaborate, ancient cave paintings with extinct animals like the woolly rhinoceros and stuff, which I think is so cool. Which, speaking of the art, is it, that's one of the best parts of the letters for me. Um, like, right from the start, Tolkien gives the, the North Pole environment this distinctive visual character. It's not the kind of, like, you know, sugary, ornate Victorian thing we associate with Santa, especially right around that time. It's, like, the house, for example, is this little sort of igloo surrounded by these spires of ice that are just kind of shapeless, like icicles upside down. And the North Pole is this kind of ominous, just white spike it's oh, it, I, it kind of it kind of weirds me out, honestly. Uh, the interiors of the house look like they've got frescoes or like sort of Slavic or Northern European wall paintings, and the things get organized in these these bands of decoration, like medieval illumination with borders and little vignettes and marginalia, which. Oh, I'll get to that in a minute. Mm. Um, <laughs> the letters themselves even just look like medieval manuscripts. Um, it took a while for him to settle on a look because the first few letters are more cursive and loopy and really shaky because Father Christmas is, you know, almost 2,000 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so cute. It's so cute. He apologizes for it. He's like, you know, but after all, I am over 1,900 years old. 
And then he eventually settles into this ornate calligraphic style. It's a little bit like various historical European scripts, like not, um, oh, I could drive myself crazy for anything, the names of them, but like Lombardic or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And adds decorative capitals and things. Then the bear, when the bear starts writing letters, writes in his own style, which starts out clumsy and childish because he has a fat paw and then becomes this quasi runic thing. And Ilbereth, the elf secretary, writes in yet another style, which is very fine and persnickety and honestly kind of looks like my grandmother's handwriting. So again, like in medieval manuscript, there's this sense that this community has like labored to produce these letters, which since it was obviously just this one guy, <laughs> makes them really <laughs> sweet. This real labor of love. I could go on getting really excited about all of them, but what do you did you like them? Um how do you do you think this slots into his interests in general? I super think it does, but what did you did you like them? Did you enjoy oh, them? Oh yeah. I hadn't I hadn't read them until we chose this topic and so I got to go out and get this like very lovely uh listeners can't see it but I got the new uh centenary centen- 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 I, I can't centen- say centen- words. centenary thank you <laughs> yeah. thank you Ned oh my god oh yeah that was I forgot to, really fast I'm sorry when we picked this topic I had forgotten that this actually is the 100th year anniversary of the letters being written so they put out this beautiful <laughs> centenary edition of the letters which has them all reproduced really really beautifully so if you can't get your hands on that do it mm-hmm. yeah it's well worth the i think it was like 28 dollars or something like it's 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 well worth it it's just like a, a really nice shot of joy when i was growing up so my mom is from venezuela and christmas is like slightly different there el nino jesus is the one who brings gifts um but uh, my, but my dad is american so we had gifts from both santa claus and el nino jesus and they did try and do like different writing on the for the labels of the gifts but <laughs> i can't imagine the time that these letters and illustrations took cuz the kids would start writing letters to father christmas in september or early october which tells you how much they loved this. Like, I don't know at what point they realized what was probably happening. I think the fact that Priscilla, you know, was doing this up until she was 14 years old really speaks to just what a wonderful tradition and connection it was with a man who perhaps was a little, I don't know, it's just a different kind of connection, I guess, uh, that, that they got to have. And that's just really, really above and beyond the usual. Just just fills me with joy. I was you know, raised con- conventional American Christian uh, uh, upbringing, uh, Anglican for what it's worth, uh, relaxed Anglican. <laughs> So basically just heathens. Well, I like to say that's the great thing about, you know, instead of Catholic guilt complexes, you have an Anglican guilt complex, meaning doesn't exist. Ah, lucky. What must that be like? It's, it's really nice, guys. It's really, really nice. <laughs> but uh, funny, uh, Oriana talking about, you know, the handwriting thing. I still remember I got a really fancy train set when I was in, oh, I don't know, third grade and all that. And there was a note from Santa there. And I was very happy. But I looked at the note and says, but that's mom's handwriting to myself. <gasps> oh, <no. laughs> and, I think, and I think I might have begun to guess yeah. <laughs> at that point. I mean, I can only add, of course, to the praise uh, uh, for the for the books, the collections, and more about that in a bit. I wanted to sort of kick off my sort of thoughts about this, and this is something I wish I had done a little more uh, reading about, frankly, uh, and that is Father Christmas himself as a figure, uh, mm-hmm. because he is not Santa Claus and very much predates Santa Claus, and in fact is its own sort of thing. You can find a very nice classic capsule history of him on Wikipedia, where else? Mm-hmm. And I'll just read from bits from the introduction here, not the full thing. That would take forever. It says, although now known as a Christmas gift bringer, normally considered to be synonymous with Santa Claus, he is originally part of an unrelated and much older English folkloric tradition. Uh, The recognizably modern figure developed in the late Victorian period, i.e. when Tolkien was a small boy himself. So it's fairly uh, obvious where he gets this sort of vision of uh, Father Christmas here is from. But here's sort of the capsule bit about uh, Father Christmas, again from Wikipedia. English personification of Christmas were first recorded in the 15th century, with Father Christmas himself first appearing in the mid-17th century in the aftermath of the English Civil War. People needed a 
break after trauma. I think we all can agree. Uh, so the Puritan-controlled English government had legislated to abolish Christmas, considering it papist, and had allowed, it, outlawed its traditional customs. Royalist political pamphleteers, linking the old traditions with their cause, adopted Old Father Christmas as a symbol of the good old days, of feasting and good cheer. And following the Restoration in 1660, his profile declined. Character was maintained into the 18th and 19th century by Christmas folk plays, or mummers plays. And until Victorian times, Father Christmas was more concerned with adult feasting and merrymaking. It didn't have any particular connection with children, nor with the giving of presents and all the other associated accoutrements. But as later Victorian Christmases developed into child-centric family festivals, Father Christmas became a bringer of gifts. And then you had a connection with Santa Claus uh, emerging over as well, and then things start crossing back and forth. So basically, the Father Christmas that we see in the letters is this later version, is this uh, post-Victorian version that is now the one that's in the popular, you know, English mind. And the concept of Father Christmas as distinct from Santa Claus, even though it's, again, shared name, is something that continues in specifically U the UK to this day. For instance, there was the film uh, by one of the Ar one of the Ardman animated films, if I remember right, uh, is called Arthur Christmas. Uh, it's supposed to be like uh, Father Christmas's, I don't forget, his nephew or brother or something like <laughs> yeah. that. That came out a few years ago. Uh, so the point is, is that that's a riff on Father Christmas, Arthur Christmas. So you see, the, the character sort of maintains. And, you know, so much for, so much for that. And uh, for the moment, we'll maybe get into more things. But uh, I think something that we had touched on uh, at the end of our last episode that is good to bring up again here again is the difference between, admittedly, these very unpublished works, these very personal, private, and published works, a version of Father Christmas versus Father Christmas showing up in Narnia. <laughs> and, oh, now, my God. And, and so the, the Tolkien-Lewis divide. And uh, I don't know, Jared, if you want to sort of kick into thoughts about that again uh, for here for a bit. but Yeah, I mean, there's... I didn't do any reading about this part, but I probably should have. <laughs> so, you know, Tolkien is really big on sort of internal consistency of things. So when C.S. Lewis threw Father Christmas into the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Tolkien got kind of pissed. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Because Narnia is not Earth. Why would they have Santa? Especially since, like, at that point, like, Narnia Jesus isn't even there. Right. It it's not it's not good world building. Sorry, it's not, it's not. <laughs> like it may be charming, but it's not like the the tightest of world building. So I know this started before Narnia and everything, but I almost wish this was like a petty response to <laughs> 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 that. Like, no, we can have an internally consistent, fantastical world with Santa Claus, but just the North Pole on Earth where he belongs. <laughs> It would be interesting if there was something in the letters or something about that specifically, but I, nothing leaps to mind, at least uh, not to my knowledge. No. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I can't get over that one. I think your point about internal consistency, and this sort of is building on a point that I also raised at the in the last episode of the preview here, is that, you know, it, it's, it's such a Tolkien move, you know, famously, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. He gets this idea and then he runs with it and creates a book we all know. So he does a small, a small thing happens. And then it just keeps going. He just looks sort of like, what have I got here? And mm -hmm. that is exactly, as Jared was outlining, uh, exactly the case with the Father Christmas letters. They uh, they start off as brief little charming moments. And then almost, you know, I don't want to say almost immediately, but just a couple of years in, you know, it, it happens. And he maintains it throughout the years. You get a sense of somebody who very much, you know, they held on to the letter. So you could go back, look and see what he was doing. It's like, okay, right. You know, this is what happened last time. And this is how everything looks. And this is what occurs so that way it can build on to itself you know it, it, new things can be introduced but uh, but he's not going to go back and suddenly if, ironically given so much of the vision that he did do <laughs> with him <laughs> he's not going to go back especially for his you could say his young captive audience and sort of like completely rethink how this is done that's just that's just not done there's you know? no there's yeah. no retconning in the father christmas letters mm -hmm. there's yeah. only forward movement i do love that he clearly like didn't you know none of this is created a whole cloth mm. which is which is what's really interesting about it you know so much of the lord of the rings world is i mean he yeah he he was still building on a lot of stuff but like a lot of it is sort of a whole cloth ish but all of the elements of the father the goblins the gnomes even the polar bear uh, is 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 all kind of borrowed. You know, Carhu he uses a lot of Finnish words, and it's not a coincidence that uh, in Lapland there is like 
there is the North Pole, like there, there is a tourist attraction that is, that purports to be Santa's workshop or whatever. I only know this because there was a, a Bake Off content, contestant that, that went there and <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, tried to, <laughs> tried to make that experience into biscuit. And I don't think it worked too well. No, he was in line for Star Baker until he really whiffed it on that. <laughs> but that was that was back that was back when challenges could be whiffed because of the baker and not external factors. And not because the challenge was yeah. Mm-hmm. We're now a GBBO podcast. <laughs> just, yeah, that was our really subtle segue into our real topic. <laughs> Surprise. We'll, we'll, we'll throw a link to this particular uh botch into the yeah, show notes, but, I'm but sure. Anyway, um, <laughs> There's there's all these elements, you know. Even the the polar bear script is is runes, uh, you know, taken taken from Norse, right? Yeah. And Finnish borrowing and the the goblin uh, the the goblin wars. It's 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 almost interesting to view it as like things that he was thinking about very early on and pulling those elements into these wonderful, totally unrelated little stories. Mm-hmm. It shares a ton of creative DNA with Lord of the Rings. Like you know, there's the, the Finnish influence and everything, but there's also, um, you can see similar sort of creative obsessions mm-hmm. reflected here where like the Lord of the Rings, like the Father Christmas letters, is a false document. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, you know, it's the Red Book of Westmarch. It has multiple um, authors mm-hmm. in universe. You know, Bilbo contributes the the early bits, I think. And then Frodo interviews everybody else for the rest of it and everything. So there's a similar kind of multiple contributors thing happening. Um, I don't know that we really think of Tolkien as like a postmodern author. <laughs> but this creating a narrative that is set at this very particular remove from the audience hmm. feels postmodern to me. A lot of, even a lot of older, like really old novels are like, Oh, the, the letters from a person mm-hmm. that is genuinely real. I swear like that kind of epistolary yeah. novel. It was like, you had to do that. Yeah. You had to pretend it was real, mm-hmm. but then that fell away. And when it was, it was brought back in a big way in around the, you know, postmodern Times like the Princess Bride. This is like the Princess Bride, but with Santa. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's a good comparison there. I think we have our episode title. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there we go. Uh, the you know uh, we we're obviously speaking of this. You know we 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 and we all know this. And just to make sure you our listeners know this, you know this is not something that was ever conceived as a oh here is a unified text. Of course, you know no. this is a, this is a <laughs> this is a collation and all that. But it is precisely because it becomes this kind of flowing open text that only ends precisely because it it has to you know essentially you know the the fiction is no longer sustainable is mm-hmm. what it ultimately comes mm-hmm. down to and uh you know that story just happens all the time with Santa Claus if you tell the Santa Claus story right up there with tooth fairies easter bunnies etc so but that again also just makes it interesting i mean you, you look at it and you just almost don't want to step out and say like you know who else does something quite this elaborate or do we know of it i mean i you know, on the one hand, you want to maybe allow for the fact there may be some great, you know, family things or somebody creative things keeping these spirits going in their own way. And I'm sure there are tons of different examples. This just happens to be a very particular example that's one, very skillfully and wonderfully done. Mm-hmm. And two, uh, is by a very famous author. <laughs> you yeah. put it together, it's kind of like, you know, it's, this is a classic this is a classic thing that wouldn't exist otherwise. We wouldn't know about this. We're not for the fact of who it was, and we're not the fact that uh, it fits in so well with his creative impulses in many different directions. And I also want to sort of skew with turn away now and sort of place also this work in the context. You could save his twenties, his nineteen twenties and thirties, where you have this, you have the Hobbit, and then you have his other, you could say, more kid friendly works that he's done. And we haven't really talked about those yet. Um, I suspect they'll be subjects for a later episode. Uh, but uh, two things, two stories that he created that were not published at the time that were also centered around, uh, you know, a kid audience and his own children were Rover Random mm. a- in, I think, the late 20s. And then in the 30s uh, was the Mr. Bliss story, and uh, both of which are just, you know, kid tales in the best sort of sense with illustrations and things like that. And so you you you, you put the letters into this context, and they're as much that as they are reflective of his big overarching 
you know, <laughs> romances, for lack of a better term. Nothing, I'm not saying anything deep or revelatory here. Just one of those things that this makes it a very interesting, unintended crossover point. It's not a standalone manuscript. It's not some sort of sixlessly tied into things. It's drawing on a very particular tree. It, 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 it really is very unique and interesting precisely for it, for that reason. Yeah, it also, be, you know, it is itself a historical document because of what was happening in the world at the time. And, you know, it does intrude upon uh, the narrative. Like, Father Christmas does start talking about, you know, oh, I'm, I can't, like, bring as many toys with me this year because I need to bring uh, clothes and food and other actual useful items because so many mommies and daddies can't give that to their children. He even talks about, um, like the goblin, you know, there is this lead up in the late 1930s where the goblin wars really start to take center stage in these letters. Uh, it's this bleeding through of, of the tension throughout Europe. And, you know, he start he, father Christmas is talking about the goblins becoming more, uh, present in the rest of the world, not just in the North. Uh, and it's, it seems like almost a one way to talk about this with your kids, I guess. Like yeah. that, I, that is something that I've never really thought. How did you talk about your, this topic with your children in the late 1930s. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I have no idea. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. This is, it's a very hard thing. You know, everyone, you know, things happen. I mean, how are, you know, how do you explain to kids right now here at the end of 2020, what's been happening with COVID or, you know, larger politics or things like that. It just sort of like you, you try and place them in terms as you can. And it's like, you know, and as kids, you know, you follow along with this sort of wide eyed, you know, you you hear the adults talking and, you know, what are they doing or how they're referencing it? I think what you touched on, Ariana, is also important because, uh, you know, these are, as with all this other work, it's the work of a war veteran. Mm hmm. And the fact that the letters stretch from 1920, when he has a young kid who, by default, never knew the war, you know, I just, you know, just sort of like this uh, and, and wouldn't have known that. And almost Tolkien's sort of like, hey, we can just sort of have fun with this for a bit. And then moving to a period where it all happens again, and eventually a child of his is going to be fighting in yeah. the war. It's sort of like, you know, it all, it all comes around, you know, for lack of a better term. These undercurrents... They, 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 how can I put it? It's, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it's hard, it's really hard and strange to say it gives a story its necessary depth. I don't think it's a necessary depth, but it's an interesting depth. It's yeah. something, it's an interesting context is what it is. It, uh, is, is, uh, someone creating something that's, uh, something sweet and normal, even while the swirls of everything are happening around. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very hard thing. I almost want to shift maybe to also just, you know, having having brought in all these deep thoughts, uh, let's just talk about how funny it is. It's right? incredibly funny. It's hilarious. That's the thing, yeah. This is not a grim accounting. <laughs> the polar bear is constantly inserting himself into uh, rhymes that, that Father Christmas and, and Ilbereth both write. And he's <laughs> constantly saying bad joke or stupid joke or whenever anyone is trying like, to like... That's not funny. Yeah, or like whenever either of them are trying to like get a burn on the polar bear uh he claps back as the, yeah. as the children say <laughs> 15 epic clapbacks from the fourth ah! polar bear. <laughs> I, he, 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 Tolkien absolutely loves characters, I think, like this, who are ridiculous without, you know, it's almost, it's, it, it, the polar bear is incredibly unselfconscious, is the best way to put it. He just He's sort of kind like, of like um, uh, Father Giles of uh, Ham, like, ish, I get that kind of vibe. To, to a degree, you know, it's almost kind of like maybe that crossed with Garm in a bit because Garm just sort of like, you know, just sort of charges <laughs> around and, and clearly it's sort of like, oh boy, here we go <laughs> and, and all that. So, and it just, and, uh, and, and his two nephews as well. And just, you know, they are, they are, they are perfect. They're perfect, gentle comedy because they all mean well. Nobody is, is, is vicious or anything in the Father Christmas circle. I mean, the goblins are their own horrible things, but they're their mm -hmm. own horrible, you know, things. That's, you know, classics are a difference. You know, we're fine them who knows um but uh you know what do the god do the goblins have a father christmas i doubt it 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 fits in with this type of humor that Tolkien clearly likes because it crops up in various different ways in his creative writing that uh there's no meanness it's just ridiculousness he, mm -hmm. he enjoys the ridiculous he enjoys this physical comedy often because you know the polar bear the polar bear is not one for wits the polar bear is just doing stupid stuff and then things very happen. slapstick <laughs> yeah, very slapstick incredibly slapstick incredibly. i mean the the illustration 
illustration on the cover of the edition I have, which is the old, one of the older hardback editions. There have been about three or four different editions over time, but uh, I'll hold it up right here. As, as you can see, it's uh, it's that particular <laughs> illustration, the one which I does. I love that drawing. It's, it, is, it is fantastic. It is pol the polar bear is trying to help. He is trying to carry a bunch of the gifts downstairs from the upper level from the stores, and pretty much the depiction is, and it's a, it's a wonderfully well-done illustration, precisely because it's a classic example of the aftermath of something. In this case, the polar bear all completely sprawled out at the base of the staircase, all the gifts and things scattered up on the staircase ab above him in his in, in his wake, and then Father Christmas at the top, basically doing a classic, ah, what are you going to do? You know, <laughs> just, you know, what happened here? And and it's it's the type of thing that is both incredibly funny, and to turn back to the art, and, you know, Jared's brought up some very good points about this, incredibly detailed. This is not some sort of random sketch. He put time into this thing. <laughs> how how much time is what I'm a lot curious like I don't think anybody knows for sure <laughs> I think this is my favorite like look at this yeah. oh yeah the one with the cave paintings and the so with the um first of all get the book everybody yeah <laughs> uh, but second in the, the same letter that has the cave paintings which is a beautiful image in its own right at the top of it is this this really atmospheric drawing of Santa Claus flying over or Father Christmas, flying over Oxford mm -hmm, with mm -hmm. his sleigh and reindeer. And it's so beautifully rendered with, like, it's the, the Oxford skyline is just silhouetted against this um, sky that's drawn with very fine pen lines. And Santa, Father Christmas, I, I'm going to keep doing that, and I'm sorry <laughs> for all of the English people out there. <laughs> Santa is just sort of swooping in from the upper right. He's very, very finely drawn, so he's very distant. And it's just, you know, the, the city recedes into the haze. And it's this really, really beautiful drawing. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, sort of, you could say, you know, in-action drawings is uh, another one where it's the one that matches with a description of one of the letters where he's flying over the layers of clouds over the ocean. Mm. Yeah, oh, that one's beautiful, too. And uh, sort of uh, avoiding avoiding the stormy the stormy uh, parts of the atmosphere where the writing is smoother. Um, it's just a lovely depiction of aerodynamics, uh, which uh, you know is a very 20th century thing. You know, really getting a sense of the layers of air and what it involves. That's the one Orion is holding it up uh, right now. And uh, and you know so that illustration almost makes me think you know of someone like William Blake to a degree. Uh, the depiction of yeah. the, this particular natural slash supernatural world. Um, I'm not trying to draw total one to ones along the way, but it has that same sort of vivid natural energy uh, I can uh, I can see in some of Blake's work, um, particular favorite of mine. Yeah, I mean, these these are the type of things that, again, you know, he puts he puts in time and care for something that he figured would only ever be seen by a total of six people at most, him, his wife, and his four kids. <laughs> That's, That's another weird thing about, about them for me personally is that it, a lot of the time when reading – Tolkien stuff that isn't the stuff published in his lifetime. I feel a little bit invasive. Mm, yeah, <laughs> like all of the the writings that Christopher Tolkien edited, you know, the Silmarillion and all that. These are things that were done. The Silmarillion was obviously intended to be published, but um, mm -hmm. other things, especially the older notes, weren't. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this especially was just for the kids. Yeah. I don't know if I'd say I feel guilty about it exactly, but it's a little, it's just a little bit invasive, especially in the letters where he's like talking very fondly to his children, even in, in those in the persona of Father Christmas. It feels like reading somebody's emails. Yeah. That's a very good comparison point. I hadn't thought about that. And it may, this may also explain why the editor, and this is, you know, we want to make clear to people, this is not some sort of unauthorized thing. This is oh, very, no. much, yeah. Yeah. very much an official Tolkien estate publication. But it is, I think, notable that the editor of this book is not Christopher Tolkien or any of the other uh, kids. It's uh, Bailey Tolkien, who was, uh, and is, I believe she's still alive, um, Christopher Tolkien's uh, second wife uh, for, uh, for, uh, for many years, and I believe, and it, again, I believe she's still alive, his widow. Um, so, uh, so that's uh, so. I think maybe the fact that it was an outsider looking at it mm -hmm. um, may have had something to do with it. And the book itself was originally published just a few years after Tolkien died. It was in the mid seventies, uh, seventy six, I believe. So uh, it is. It was. It was you know, even before the Silmarillion, which is interesting in its own right. Now that I think about it, it sort of beat yeah. the Silmarillion to the formal punch. Maybe because it was something like. 
you know, it'd be very interesting to know what the discussion was like, you know, among the family and all that. Maybe they just thought it was like, hey, here's something just really nice. Remember this, you know, maybe the, the subject came up, you know, and all and, you know, all four of his children were still very much alive at that point. So uh, so it was just maybe just thought it should be just like, yeah, why don't we do that? Or maybe Bailey just had seen these and say, you know, these are great, you know, and all that. Yeah. But we just don't yeah. know. This cl- the, the classic opacity of the uh, Tolkien estate about why they choose to do the things they do is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I sort of love that about them. They're just going to do what they're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I want to be clear that I don't, I don't think it's wrong that this was published or something. It just, there's just moments where it's especially um, towards the, the beginning and the end of it, where it's less of a narrative and more about addressing a particular child. Cause in the beginning there's just John mm-hmm. and at the end there's just Priscilla. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it kind of this fading in and fading out where the letters are really personal, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. even though they're again, still fictional, still, mediated through the person of father christmas but this yeah it's it just it's a little it's a little weird to be reading them sometimes the rest of the time is great they're fabulous yeah <laughs> i think you're right there it's a it's a it's a lovely crossover yeah you feel uh, just a little bit of a voyeur you know just a little bit yeah i mean not enough to not read them but you know yeah. <laughs> right. i mean the closest thing to it, the only other thing I can think to it uh, in terms of that sort of personal uh, sort of uh, thing in that regard would probably be the uh, Tolkien Family Album, which was published in the early 90s. And that's a collection of various photographs and things uh, from the family's collection, uh, just of them all growing up and things like this. And again, that was done by uh, – did John do that? I think that was John and Priscilla of his kids who uh, did that one. So uh, that makes Michael, I think, the only one who of the kids – who didn't do a editing of any of the particular uh, books or anything like that. So, and, you know, hey, I'm sure he had his reasons. <laughs> so, and, uh, you know, not, not, not everyone feel, needs to feel obligated to do that. Maybe to turn this to a subject that I think is a sort of big tale, and I know Oriana was very excited about this whenever the names came up, is how much the languages uh, played yes. out, both both Finnish, of course, and also I think he actually invents yet another language at some point in here, doesn't he? Or am I... Yep. The polar bear comes up with an alphabet based on the drawings in the goblin caves. As one does. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, why not? <laughs> so, yeah, even in even in this children's thing, Tolkien is still like, you know what's really cool? Obscure alphabet. Right. <laughs> Which I don't disagree, but. It looks like people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like all the letters look like they're formed from people. I'm... They almost look like um, in Rudyard Kipling's just so stories oh. that alphabet that gets invented they remind me of that that's a good comparison point yeah yeah you would have asked role models yeah did these did the did the did the finnish bear names leap out of you when you were reading it oriana as like, soon oh, as I they said Karhu, I, like i i i actually barked a laugh when uh, the polar bear in a in a letter goes P.S. My name is Karhu, but don't tell anyone because uh, <laughs> the word for bear in most Northern European languages, it, you know, is taboo. Yeah. You don't speak it, and so for, for so that's an extra little funny little wrinkle. Like he's yeah. just having fun with 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 his kid. Like I don't know if the kids knew that the word for bear is typically taboo in Finnish and, and Germanic languages, but uh, I just got a real kick out of that. Yeah, that is, I had, I had forgotten that detail until you brought it up, but yeah, that's absolutely true. And that's one of the reasons um, that to dip into linguistics for a moment, why not? It's a Tolkien podcast. <laughs> exactly. That's the reason that the English word bear and the, you know, the sort of Norse words like Bjorn or whatever, mm-hmm. the reason they don't resemble the other Indo-European words for bear, like Arctos and Ursus, is that the the word for bear was so taboo that it ended up being lost. And bear is just a euphemism, which I think is supposed to mean the brown one or something like that. Yep. Wow. So... Yeah, the the original whatever the original Germanic word for bear is no longer exists because they, it was such a such a powerful taboo. Mm-hmm. Wow! So don't tell anybody. <laughs> don't tell anybody. That's why because Karhu is the Finnish is the was the taboo word I believe. Um, it, it no longer taboo. Like there's like a there's like I think there's a Finnish clothing brand uh, or at least when I was in Helsinki I walked past a store that was called 
Karu. But, uh, but that's just, <laughs> you know, he didn't need to do that. Like, I, I'm so curious if the kids knew that or if he, if that was just like his own little private joke for himself while writing these incredibly detailed letters. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I something I do love about uh, and this is kind of I think another argument I would say gets into excuse me sort of betrayal of the world there is uh, is frankly it, it, it's office humor is what it is it's, uh, <laughs> oh my it, God. It's, I wonder if Tolkien got it from just academic meetings where like somebody is tr- trying to come in and say let's do this and then just completely all falls apart but you get a sense yeah. that you know there there are multiple depictions of you know the polar of Carhu of the NPB trying to help and basically screwing it all up and we mentioned the slapstick but there's also just this sense of just sort of like you know if you just let him do what, what they've always done they'll be fine <laughs> but he tried but you know sometimes Father Christmas tries to improve something and it and it works, and then the polar bear screws it up. Sometimes the polar bear comes up with the idea, and then it screws up. And uh, I think one of my favorite moments is uh, basically there's a little drawing of uh, there. There are a couple of these. This is not the only time where a car who is basically just pointing out to the elves on a, on the little uh, helper elves on a uh, on a like you know a, a sketch pad or something like that, saying here's what we're going to do and all the rest of it. And they're basically the comment something like we're all ignoring him. We're just paying attention to the things over here. <laughs> There's and there's also like that that good help is hard to find vibe <laughs> where Father Christmas is constantly delegating and regretting it because you know then the polar bear will delegate to the snowmen or the no the snowboys sorry oh yeah that's right yeah uh, and they'll mess it up because because they're made of snow <laughs> what do you think. You know, so yeah, it's it is like oh, I I see. This is you've you've had a you've encountered this problem before of delegating and regretting it. <laughs> yeah, well, even some of the some of the incidents that happen, um, I think like the bathtub overflowing is one of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, are directly based on things that happened to the Tolkien household. Oh, really? Oh, that would make sense then. Oh, I should have had this bookmarked, but there, yeah, it, like somebody overflowed a bathtub and it ruined a ton of papers in the study or something like that. And then that showed <laughs> up in the letter that year. Oh, <laughs> so did the illnesses, because the, um, the polar bear at one point gets a uh, whooping cough and the his little nephews get mumps. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm wondering, I'm guessing those might correspond to certain childhood illnesses suffered by... Probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I remember reading that. <laughs> That sounds about right. It's also it's also a nice way to sort of tie into you know where things were you know at the time you know the vaccinations uh, hadn't mm. uh, really kicked in for those things yet. MMR hadn't come along fully and and uh, you know it, they that that is the other nice thing about it. You know they are very reflective of their times. There's mentions of specific gifts along the way here and there. A couple of which sound one of those classic like oh yeah those are the gifts they don't make anymore for probably good reasons because <laughs> they're just made of straight asbestos and they're all a choking hazard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or they're figures who are a little too stereotypical, shall we say, or other things like that. So it's mm. sort of like, well, but then again, you know, this is this is, you know, this is the time. This is where we're at. And, uh, you know, one other interesting thing and in one of the letters, uh, Father Christmas t- basically lists off like the members of the British Commonwealth. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, so I guess that's like his domain exclusively, which is which is pretty funny i guess uh i don't really know what to make of it except like i think the only reason i actually noticed it is because i've been we've been watching uh season four of the crown and we just watched the episode about uh the commonwealth nations and i was like oh oh father christmas only go- uh, mm, all right <laughs> fine you know <laughs> Father Christmas revised. <laughs> right. We're cancel- canceling Father Christmas. Yeah, because cancel culture has gone too far. <laughs> Father Christmas the imperialist. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> Tying into our earlier episode on that subject, but anyway. <laughs> I have no feelings about... I, I do not think Father Christmas is a necessarily imperialist concept. I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you uh, well. I guess... 
Like if you if you really wanted to, you could probably yeah, call this an argument. But you I probably don't want could. To. But I don't like. I just. I have. We have other more pressing matters. <laughs> there um, are actual problems in this world. Right? Who knew? Who knew? But that's part of the other joy of it too. Is that for all that the real world you know creeps in around the corners because it has to. It 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 is it is easily one of his most you know, let's say it escapist works. It's just some of the things like it's, it's just so pleasant. I love one of the things I really love as well. They always tell about their adventures getting ready for Christmas or something comes up mm-hmm. and interrupts. I do love the moments where they're basically talking about when nothing is happening and they're yeah. just talking about our monsters. They're like, Oh, it was great in summer. And we had the little like whales come up and spout through the, you know, through a bunch of the ice or whatever it was. And they're all just sort of relaxing. <laughs> and it just sort of like, that sounds so nice. It does know? sound yeah. nice. I want to hang out with some whales. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it just, that sounds great. It's just so, it's it, it's just so sweet and fun. It's a it's a it's it's nice to have something again too that is not like the you know to draw the comparison. The Santa Claus version is you have Santa Claus, Mrs. Claus, you know, a bunch of like you know little uh, little elves and uh, and then the reindeer. Here, the reindeer there are no names. They're just the reindeer. <laughs> you know, they're just there. There's no certainly no Rudolph. Rudolph was came along you know a couple of years later anyway. Um, and uh, there's no Mrs. Claus. As far as we can tell, it's just simply confirmed bachelor Father Christmas hanging hanging with his bear, hanging with his yeah. bear. That's all I gotta say. All I gotta say, uh, people. <laughs> I was thinking about that, and it occurred to me I don't actually know if Father Christmas is married. Santa Claus is married, but is Father Christmas married? Well, I'll take a quick dive into that uh, Wikipedia page yeah, again. Uh, but my sense is not is the best way to put it. He just simply, I mean, the 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 way the character is described. Um, as this sort of like unjust spirit is pretty much the closest thing I can think of before the late Victorian sort of like Father Christmas Santa Claus fusion is very clearly the ghost of Christmas present from A Christmas Carol mm-hmm. um, who is portrayed as a very you know Falstaffian figure uh, he's just sort of like you know just like ah let's celebrate it's a good time yeah. and things like that know me better man yes exactly Muppet Christmas Carol best and only <laughs> there, yeah, I yeah if you don't like Muppet Christmas Christmas Carol, I'm 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 sorry. Where is your soul? You're not allowed to listen to this podcast. <laughs> oh, jeez. We will take it out of your feed if we somehow yeah, <laughs> discover. Yeah. Not liking that is is just wrong and bad. So, uh, but yeah, uh, th- th- exactly that though. I mean, that's the that's the image. He seems to be more just sort of a a solitary, like you know, hey, someone who comes in and just gets the party going <laughs> and all that. So domesticity, what's that? It's time for a drink, and it's you could argue very Saturday alien is uh, what yeah. it is too and uh, if we want to go further back although I mentioned kind of the more origins of uh, the character as such beforehand and so it's a it's interesting it's a more domesticated transformed father christmas by the time Tolkien is getting around to it uh, with his kids, but it's not conventionally so. It uh, it is uh, he is if anything more like uh, more like you know someone like Bilbo, someone who's just sort of like you know the person who has his fancy house and then he has his friends and fellow folks coming around uh, and all that, and that's that's kind of what what he has. Yeah, the kind of boring center uh, around which whirl a group of total weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> One way to put it. Which- that so speaking of one of my favorite letters is the one where this is another way in which this is like sort of a dry run for a lot of things that came later um or were happening simultaneously is Mm -hmm. um the letter from 1938 turns into this long poem Mm. yeah um, which yes is fine but what makes it really good, the poem itself is not that great, but what makes it really good is, the, you know, this instance really good, is that it's full of little interpolations from the bear and from Ilbreth, the elf secretary, where the 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 bear is, like, writing weak next to really terrible yep. rhymes, <laughs> and um, the elf is arguing with the bear in the margins or <laughs> or correcting Father Christmas's little mistakes or saying that he had to help him out with this one thing. It's so, so funny. <laughs> it's, it, it's very it's very medieval marginalia humor, isn't it? Yes. Uh, it, it is. But it's also like editorial humor. It's sort of like, you know, yeah. you send out your papers, you correct them, or you are someone like Tolkien was, you're marking up papers yourselves. It's sort of like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
even the even the notes rhyme sometimes. The bear can't spell correctly. <laughs> um, Ilbreth is such a persnickety little son of a gun. <laughs> oh, he at one point I think the polar bear calls him a rude little errand boy, <laughs> and yeah. it's amazing. I think that might be in the in the letter just like the year before he calls him a, a rude little errand boy. Mm-hmm. It's uh, which is. It's, Delightful. Elbreth is the MVP. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're all flipping through and finding finding our favorite bits. It's, it's, a, it's a good book for that. It really is. Oh, I found the rude little errand boy. It's on page 160 if you're looking for it, Oriana. Ilbreth wonders, is talking about the polar bear falling into a, a tree and catching on wire like Christmas lights and his fur catching on fire. Hmm. Oh, yeah. And then Ilbreth wonders if roast polar is good to eat, and the bear goes, not as good as well, spanked and fried elf. <laughs> Naughty. <laughs> and the the and Ilbreth says something about this in this I believe in this letter the pictures are supposed to be drawn by Yeah, the pictures have been drawn by the bear. Yeah. And they're very scratchy and bad. And I think this is Tolkien's excuse for just not having time to do a good one. Um, <laughs> he usually blames the bear for stuff that goes wrong in his own life as well as very handy. So like towards the end, Ilbris says something about the last picture is imaginary and not very good. <laughs> but I hope it will come true, which is Christmas actually happening this year. Uh, <laughs> It's just, uh, oh, and then at the end of the letter, the polar bear says something, uh, Ilbereth is cheeky, and cheeky is misspelled, but he spells Ilbereth correctly. <laughs> <laughs> also, in that same letter, Ilbereth writes in Elvish. Yeah, he writes in a sort of, I think yeah. it's a proto Proto-Tenguar. Proto-tenguar. So we've got, like, three different, we've got, like... Three different, like, just English writing styles, runes, and Tenguar. There, there is a lot happening here. Yeah, there's, there's so, so layered, and I have to sort of retroact or apologize for something I said in the last episode, where I said something about finding it sort of like saccharine or something like that. Mm. It's not. It's just delightful. I think when I first read them, I was this would have been like you know the early years, so like early teens, mm-hmm. and I as a lot of teens are, was like, oh, my God, sincerity? Oh, my Mm-mm. God, I can't deal. I can't. Mm-mm. I can't. And these How embarrassing. Are, so, yeah, so I got, like, secondhand embarrassment from just a, a dad writing really loving letters to his kids. Mm. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, they're fine. They're pretty, but they're sort of trite. And, bleh. and now I'm just like, oh, my God, what was wrong with me at that age? These are wonderful. Having nephews and nieces will do that for you, won't it? <laughs> or just growing up. Yeah. You know, that too. And that too. I think we all with... grew up kind of irony poisoned and are finally getting it out of our systems. I feel like since 2015, 2016, I personally have undergone, like I have been like slowly wringing the irony poisoning from, from my body um, yeah. and finally appreciate this. Same. Just yeah, being able to look at something that is just there's no emotional barrier between you and the yeah. text here. There's yeah. there's no like there's no distancing aside from the meta narrative stuff. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. all it's just like totally genuine and sincere, and that can be scary sometimes. Yeah, especially if you're just a teen. It's yeah, like, I don't mm-hmm. know what's happening in my life right now. I have to distance myself from my own feelings about right. anything. I also <laughs> think like you know my parents didn't. They, no knock on my parents uh, in this in this particular realm, but you know, there's I think for me maybe there's a little bit of jealousy. Like, and in order to deal with that jealousy, it's like, oh well, this is like cringe, uh, <laughs> and it's <laughs> and it's not cringe at all. Uh, it's wonderful. It is lovely. Yeah, we were. I didn't talk about this at the beginning, but w- the way I was raised. I feel like it comes up every episode, like, oh, Ray's like Pentecostal Christian, all sorts of weird stuff was happening. Mm. But my parents, um, when it came to Christmas, a lot of people were like, oh, my God, like Santa, Santa, we love Santa. And then people that we knew, like friends of my parents were like, Santa is an anagram for Satan. So they didn't do, yeah. they didn't do that. Uh, but my parents were like, if any of us asked, and we had all these like Santa movies and everything, but if any of us asked, like, is Santa real? They'd be like, well, he was a real person. Like, St. Nicholas mm. was real. 
but the presents are coming from us. <laughs> <laughs> He's not doing it for you. Just don't tell your friends because you'll ruin it for them. <laughs> that was... uh, they would. They would never have done. <laughs> no. They wouldn't have done this. <laughs> no. Mm-mm. Which I'm fine with. I don't yeah. care. It's fine. <laughs> Okay, so the choice of episode has come back to me, and I am doing, I won't call it a sequel to last January's episode, but in the same way that uh, our previous January episode was a way to sort of clear decks and look ahead and look at something different, um, I'll be doing that again with this episode. Uh, We'll have two episodes in a row now where we're not really talking about Middle Earth, at least not directly, Um, but again, there are always connections. And in the same way that uh, we talked about Farmer Giles of Ham, uh, the last Last time around, we're going to be talking about another collaboration with uh, Pauline Baines, and importantly, the final one that he did with her, or I believe close to the last, uh, before his passing, and that is his other notable work of short fiction uh, that he published during his lifetime, and that would be Smith of Wooten Major. Uh, Uh, Very, very uh, remarkable text. Um, It was even seen at the time as being a little elegiac, although uh, he himself wasn't having any feelings of, like, you know, that this was the end in any way. Uh, um, and we'll talk more about that in the episode. Um, but uh, I think it's a remarkable book. It has been paired with uh, Farmer Giles of Ham and various republications over time, uh, partially because both of them are illustrated, again, as mentioned by Pauline Baines. But it is a much different story than Farmer Giles of Ham. It is set in a sort of mock medievalist setting, uh, but uh, Farmer Giles of Ham is just a rollicking, ridiculous joke. Uh, Smith of Wooden Major is a much, much different work on many levels. Um, it has its own elements of satire and humor in it, uh, but with a much different intent. And it's a very, every time I reread it, it, it takes on new forms. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very interesting text, and I think has to be viewed in the context of his later work. In terms of the edition, I encourage people to read uh, beforehand. Uh, we, I do encourage you to read it. Um, there, uh, there are, there is a more recent edition, uh, same way as the Farmer Giles of Ham, that was uh, illustrated by Alan Lee in the Tales of the Perilous Realms collection. Perfectly fine to read that if that's the one you can access. And Alan Lee's illustrations are, you know, are are great. He's a fantastic artist, of course. But I do encourage you to try and find an edition illustrated by Pauline Baines, precisely because it was the original collaborator. Also, if you can try and find the edition, I forget which anniversary, but there is a separate annotated new edition that came out within the past few years, um, maybe even past couple of decades. I could be wrong, but uh, but it, 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 like Farmer Giles of Ham, it too has illustrations. As not merely illustrations from Baines, including a couple of updated ones, but full annotations from the team of Wayne Hammond and Christina Skull, uh, background information about the creation of it, so forth, details from Tolkien about the creation of uh, Smith & Wooten Major itself. Um, I do encourage you to find that one and read that one, uh, because that will give you much more insight into it, and it is a remarkable story, and we'll talk about it more next time. Uh, I will also wrap up and say that this is, of course, our final one of the year. We have made it through 2020. (laughs) You'll be hearing this sometime in early December. Have a very good holiday season. Stay very, very safe, of course, uh, as you get through it all. We will not be recording our next episode until after the start of the new year. We give ourselves a break, because frankly, we all deserve it. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, we'll have our first episode to you uh, hopefully by the second Monday or so in January, if not sooner, is the plan. Uh, but we'll see how quickly we get to things, and then we'll start the cycle anew. And uh, who knows? We may have new Amazon news at that point. We may not. We may never no, <laughs> I think so. The Amazon news last time came out because uh, it was the the Television Critics Association press tour, which happens in January and July slash August, uh, and so. I am unsure if that's if they're doing like a virtual one this year or or something. Um, Amazon may or may not actually present at this little press tour gather non gathering. Um, so we'll see. Cross our fingers. Yeah. So, 
All right. Well, uh, with that ill said, uh, again, very happy holidays to you. See yourself out through the end of the year in one piece. Uh, best to everybody. Here's to a better 2021 for everybody. <laughs> Here's to health and happiness on a broad level, because Lord knows that would be lovely. Uh, until that time, as always, our contact information uh, follows here in our outro. Check the show notes for more. Uh, thank you all again for listening very, very much. We really appreciate it. Into our next year we go. And until next time, we'll see you in the new year. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks again for listening to this episode of By the Bywater. Please subscribe and rate us via your favorite podcast listening options. Episodes and show notes are at megaphonic.fm slash by the bywater, all one word. You can also message us through here. Email us at by the bywater at megaphonic.fm or follow us on Twitter at by the bywater. You can also follow us individually on Twitter and ask questions there. I'm at Vandroid Helsing. I'm at Schwinter, S-C-H-W-I-N-D-T-E-R. And I'm Ned Raggett, two G's, two T's. By the Bywater is a proud member of Megaphonic Podcast Network. Find all our fancy little shows at megaphonic.fm. We hope you join us again next time. Until then, Namarie. Namarie.